does violence against women represent a concern for United Nations and you as a special rapporteur on violence against women? Yes, uh, it is a concern both to the UN and to my mandate. To the UN broadly, not only the Human Rights Council, the General Assembly, but also to uh, UN agencies on the ground who provide technical assistance, technical cooperation. It is seen as a pervasive and widespread human rights violation across the globe. The manifestations might be different, the prevalence rates might be different, but every country is impacted. What have you achieved since you took over your position as a Special Rapporteur of UN on Violence Against Women in 2009? I think I've managed to build on the work of my two predecessors, but also push the notion of state responsibility and accountability to a larger extent in the last five years through my thematic reports, through my country mission reports, that we need to hold states accountable to protect, to prevent, to punish, and to provide effective remedies for acts of violence against women. What are the mechanisms used by the UN to urge member states in order to eliminate violence against women? Well, I, uh, the thematic reports produced by the mandate, uh, I produce two reports a year, one to the Human Rights Council, one to the General Assembly. Um, to try and push governments to understand that violence against women is not just domestic violence, first of all, that there are many manifestations of violence, that there needs to be a, um, a multidimensional approach to reaching elimination of violence against women, which means that you have to take difference into account. You have to take contextual factors, you have to take social factors, economic factors. So the thematic reports try and do that to create a larger and better understanding of what we're looking at. The thematic reports also look at the issue of state responsibility so governments can understand what their compliance obligations are under international law. Secondly, the country mission reports is another mechanism and country visits are at the invitation of governments. Um, many of us do not wait for those invitations. We send requests to governments. Uh, we have complete discretion on the countries we choose, we send a request and we go on the mission. The missions are very fruitful because we engage in a dialogue with states and with non-state actors. During a country mission, you visit state institutions, you speak to civil servants, to ministers, etc. But importantly, you speak to civil society organizations to hear both sides. And the country mission reports are presented to the Human Rights Council um, they set out the factual situation in the country. They set out how violence impacts a woman's civil and political rights, economic, social, cultural rights, and more importantly, they highlight gaps and challenges in the state's response, whether it's in laws, policies, programs, budget allocations, etc. And lastly, the reports make recommendations. Depending on the context, the recommendations might be just to the state, on law and policy reform, on programmatic, on other issues that are not being addressed. There could be recommendations to donor countries in contexts like Somalia, Afghanistan, etc. There could be recommendations to UN agencies on the ground. Uh, and so hopefully they provide um, some sort of document that helps a government to reflect internally. So those are country mission reports. A third mechanism is participating in events such as this, um, attending conferences, giving talks at different forums, to create more awareness, not only on the substance of violence against women, but the issue of human rights and the human rights of women in particular. You are from South Africa. Can you evaluate the situation of violence against women in the African continent? Um, I can't evaluate the continent because I haven't been throughout the continent, but I've been to parts of Africa. I think the usual world view is Africa is seen as this continent of conflict and diseases and just, you know, uh, corruption, etc. But there are pockets of really good um, examples and best practices, you know, in parts of Africa on legislation. I think more recently we've been seeing the African Commission on Human Rights addressing the issue of early and forced marriages in a way, in a context that's really difficult where either religion or customary law or practice, social practices condone the marriages of young girls 
and you've got the African Commission on Human Rights coming up very strongly. I think the African Commission on Human Rights has also made it clear that the issue of uh, uh, sexual violence in conflict is unacceptable. It needs to be addressed. Um, the protocol on women uh, from the African uh, system of human rights is very progressive, uh, sometimes more progressive than uh, some of the international instruments on women's human rights. So I think there's been a disservice in some ways done to the African continent and the African human rights system because the focus has been on the negativity uh, to a large extent as opposed to there have been positive. I mean, the African Protocol on Women, if one analyzes it, there are provisions there that are really, really progressive that we don't see in international law, including provisions on violence against women.